Eight medicosis perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense, and now let's talk about ventilation. First, we need to understand the difference between obstructive lung disease and restrictive lung disease. Obstructive lung disease, I cannot get the air out. Restrictive lung disease, I cannot get the air in. Examples, obstructive, they are the asthma, the COPD, which includes chronic bronchitis and emphysema, bronchiectasis, which could be caused by cystic fibrosis, and bronchiolitis. However, restrictive is any disease that ends in osis, such as lung fibrosis, asbestosis, silicosis, pneumoconiosis, etc. Another example of restrictive lung disease is if your lung surface area has diminished. Example is one patient who removed one of his two lungs. That's a diminished total surface area of the lung that's available for gas exchange. Therefore, the lung is restricted from filling. There is less area. What is pressure? Pressure is force divided by the surface area. What's the force if I'm talking about atmospheric pressure? The force here is the weight of the air on top of the point that you are measuring. So I want the pressure on the sea level. Sure. Okay, you measure the force. What's the force? The weight. The weight of all the air above. Oh, how about the pressure on the top of the mountain? Yep, just calculate the weight of the air above you. Since this is a bigger weight than this one, that's why atmospheric pressure is greater at sea level than on the mountain top. Normal atmospheric pressure at sea level equals 1 atm, which is atmospheric pressure, equals 760 millimeters of mercury. Here is a very, very important rule. Let's say that air pressure in California is 20, but in Arizona is just 5. So, the wind will blow from California to Arizona, from the higher pressure to the lower pressure. The difference between them is called the driving pressure. Imagine that you're driving your car from California to Arizona. That's the driving pressure. How much pressure is the driving pressure? 20 minus 5 equals 15 millimeters of mercury. That's the driving pressure. When we talk about pressure in our respiratory system, we're talking about pressure relative to the atmosphere. So when I say the pressure in my trachea is negative 4, it means... What's the ATM? Normally 760. Minus 4, so the pressure inside my trachea is 756 millimeters of mercury. In other words, the pressure in my trachea is lower than that in the atmospheric pressure by 4. How about the pressure in my alveoli is like positive 5? It means that the pressure in my alveoli is greater than the atmospheric pressure by 5. So it's 765. Negative 5 is the same concept. What if I say zero? It means the air pressure in the trachea is the exact same thing as the air pressure in the atmosphere. Okay, during inspiration, what happens during inspiration? Oh, I'm inspiring. Air is coming into my lung. Therefore what? The pressure here has to be greater than here and that's why the air is flowing into my lung. So the atmospheric pressure is greater than the alveolar pressure at this point, which means that the alveolar pressure was negative at the beginning of inspiration, which forced the air to the inside. But in expiration, the air is going to the outside. Therefore, the alveolar pressure now is positive, which means it's greater than that of the atmospheric pressure. Next is Boyle's Law. What does that mean? Boyle's Law says that if the temperature remains constant, the relationship between volume of air and pressure of air is inverse. Oh, so as the volume increases, the pressure decreases and vice versa. Let me give you an example. Let's say here is a bubble of air and here is another bubble. This one is bigger, so this one has a greater volume. Therefore, this one will have a lower pressure. How about the smaller one? The volume is smaller, however, the pressure is larger than that of the big bubble. We can say P1 times V1 for the big bubble equals P2 times V2 for the small bubble. So here is a question for you. Question number one. Imagine that this bubble had pressure of 10, volume 200. Okay. Second bubble, volume is 100. What is the pressure? You just write down this equation according to the Boyle's law. P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. So P2 equals P1 times V1 over V2 equals 10 times 200 over 100 equals 20. So the pressure in the second bubble is 20. Have you noticed that the pressure here is greater than the pressure here? You know why is this? Because the volume here was greater than the volume here. It's an inverse relation. During inspiration, the diaphragm is pulled downwards, creating a negative pressure in the alveoli, sucking the air into the inside. 
But during expiration, the diaphragm begins by not contracting downwards, but actually going back to its normal position, going upwards. This creates a positive pressure. So the pressure here is greater than here. Therefore, the air will flow to the outside of my body. To understand positive pressure ventilation, we need first to understand inspiration and expiration normally. Normally, inspiration creates a negative pressure in my alveoli, which sucks the air in. <gasps> I'm inspiring. Expiration is the opposite. I have positive intraalveolar pressure. Let's talk about positive ventilation pressure. Positive ventilation pressure basically does not let your pressure fall down to become negative. Oh, it's always above the atmospheric pressure, no matter what. Side effects of, oh, if it's too much positive, it can lead to... Positive pressure in the pleura, a condition known as tension pneumothorax. Also, positive pressure here means it's difficult for the blood to go upwards because there is a higher pressure here. And as you know, blood goes from high pressure to low pressure. If, I'm cannot, if I cannot push the blood upward, I will decrease my venous return, which is the blood returning into my heart. This will decrease the cardiac output, of course. If the input is low, the output will be low. And this, of course, will decrease my blood pressure. How about negative pressure ventilation or the iron lung? It acts as a pleura. Oh, what do you mean? It creates a negative pressure. You know the diaphragm when it contracts? It's the same thing. We create a negative pressure here so that air is forced in. And in expiration, we do the opposite. Lung pressures, we have five. Driving pressure, transrespiratory pressure, transmural pressure, transpulmonary pressure, and transthoracic pressure. Okay, the name has the answer. Driving pressure, imagine that you're driving from California to Arizona. From high pressure to low pressure. Thank you. Transrespiratory pressure. Respiratory. What's your respiratory unit? The alveoli. Oh, so it's the pressure in my alveoli minus the pressure in the atmosphere. Thank you. Transmural pressure. What does the word mural mean? It means a wall. <gasps> so it's the pressure across the wall. Yes. So the pressure in my alveoli minus the pressure outside of my alveoli. Transpulmonary pressure. It's the pressure across the lung. What's in the lung? Oh, alveoli and pleura. So it's the intraalveolar pressure minus the intrapleural pressure. How about transthoracic pressure across the thorax? Now, this is not just the lung, this is the thorax. So it's the difference between the intraalveolar pressure and the pressure on your surface, on the surface of your skin or thoracic wall. Let's go. Driving pressure. You're driving from California to Arizona from 20 to 5. So it basically means that air or fluid in general goes from 20 to the 5, from high pressure to low pressure, and the driving pressure is the difference, which is 15 millimeters of mercury. Next, transrespiratory pressure. What's your respiratory unit? The alveoli. So it's the pressure outside minus the pressure inside. Thank you. Of course, the pressure outside is the atmospheric pressure. Transmural. Mural means wall, across the wall. So it's the pressure inside the airway minus the pressure outside the airway. Transpulmonary across the lungs, so the pressure in the alveoli minus the pressure in the pleura. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Transthoracic pressure across the thorax, pressure in the alveoli minus pressure on the body surface. The negative intrapleural pressure is due to the dynamic harmonious antagonism between the chest wall, which wants to expand outwards, and your lungs, which want to collapse inwards. Let's talk about lung compliance, which is change in volume over change in pressure. Now, the opposite of that is called elastance. Elastance is change in pressure over change in volume. Compliance, delta V over delta P. Your normal volume, which is your, your tidal volume, is 500 ml, which is 0.5 liters, over change in pressure, which is about 5. Remember when I told you that the pressure inside the alveoli, let's say positive 5, yep, 0.5 over 5 is 0.1 liters per centimeters of water, which happens to equal... 100 ml because you multiply by a thousand to get the ml ml per centimeters of water compliance is the same thing as expansibility or distensibility if the lung is super compliant it will be very easy to expand it in other words it has a higher delta v over a given p compliance is opposite to surface tension surface tension wants my lung to collapse but compliance wants it to relax and expand. Compliance is opposite to elasticity. The elastic recoil tendency of the lung wants it to collapse, but compliance wants it to expand. These green words are synonyms and these blue words are synonyms. Lung expansion is the same thing as compliance, which is equal. Expansibility or distensibility. Surfactant helps compliance. 
elastase helps compliance emphysema has increased compliance more than a normal lung lung collapse equals recoil equals elasticity or elastic recoil or elastic recoil tendency surface tension elastin and fibrosis so lung fibrosis which is a restrictive lung disease will decrease compliance but emphysema which is an obstructive lung disease will increase compliance the normal lung is like your normal sock but emphysema is like the sock with a lax rubber band it's very easy to expand it i.e increased compliance but if you leave it alone it's not gonna recoil on its own however restrictive lung disease or lung fibrosis is a lung with a very strong rubber band like this it's impossible to expand it the compliance goes down the drain but once you leave it alone it's gonna shrink on its own the recoil tendency is huge compliance is the expansibility of the lung delta v over delta p what causes the recoil which is opposite to compliance surface tension and elasticity does emphysema raise compliance or reduce comp compliance emphysema will raise compliance emphysema is like the sock with the lax rubber band do you remember the first slide where I told you that obstructive lung disease? I cannot get the air out. Oh, so it's very easy to get the air in, but it's very hard to get the air out. That's why we have air trapping and a barrel chest. Here's a question for you. You have A, B, and C. One of them is normal. One of them have emphysema, which is an obstructive lung disease. And the third one has amiodarone and bleomycin, which is a pulmonary fibrosis so which one is which of course B in the middle this is the normal person a is obstructive lung disease such as emphysema Y look at this compliance it's huge yep it's the highest point but the normal will be here and C is the lowest of the low the low compliance this is lung fibrosis obstructive will shift the curve to the left but restrictive will shift it to the right Acute asthma will acutely decrease the patient's lung compliance. Think about it. I'm having asthma. <laughs> Is there any expensability? No, it's gone. What's the definition of asthma in just two sentences? It's bronchial hyperreactivity and excessive mucus secretion. The lung alone tends to collapse. The chest wall alone tends to expand. If you put both of them together, which is normal human beings, you are in the middle. 0.1 liters per centimeters of water. Flail chest. When the chest wall movement is effed up, it's called paradoxical because these ribs are broken. When I breathe in, normally they should go outwards. Instead, they're going inward. So what's going to happen here? Increased pressure. Yeah, they're going inwards. Decreased volume. Yeah, they're going inwards. When the lung collapses, it's called atelectasis. Remember that compliance was delta V over delta P. Now, elastance is the exact opposite. This is the elastic recoil. Hooke's law. Hooke's law is very similar to the law of diminishing marginal return in economics. Imagine a student who is studying for the exam. The student starts studying more. Okay, that's fine. Studying even more. That's fine. But then the student is starting studying like crazy to the point that she's no longer having enough sleep. Oh, that's having a bad effect. It's a negative return. Hooke's law is describing a spring. If you give it one unit of force, it will give you one unit of length. Awesome, two units of force will give you two units of length. But until a point when you stretch it too far, pew, it's gonna rupture, it's over. So there is a limit beyond which the elastic substance will eventually break. Same thing with the alveoli, give it one unit of force, it's gonna expand, beautiful. Too much force, pew, ruptured. The way I remember Hooke's law is I think of a hooker's, okay. Prostitution for a moderate amount will give you big bucks, but too much prostitution, you will catch an STI and go to jail. So that's the negative return. It's the law of diminishing marginal return. Of course, this is just a joke to remember it. Surfactant, it's anti-surface tension. Surface tension wants my lung to collapse, but surfactant is gonna protect me and allow me to breathe. <sighs> What is surface tension? It's the adhesion molecule. Look at this. There's adhesion between these molecules here so that the pain is not dropping, so that bugs can actually walk on water. Lung expansion is affected by one, surface tension, two, Laplace law, and three, surfactant, which is anti surface tension. Normally, your lung is made of air and water. Between them, there is surface tension wanting your lung to collapse, but the surfactant is coming to rescue. The surfactant is made by type 2 pneumocytes and it's made of 
phospholipids, phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylglycerol. It's made around the 28th week of gestation. Insulin is so bad, it actually decreases the production of surfactant. But cortisol is doozy, thyroxine is beautiful, prolactin is nice. What did Laplace say? That the collapsing pressure equals surface tension over the radius, or as I like to say, Peter. Laplace, or let's call him Peter Laplace. Peter, P equals T over R. Pressure, this is the descending pressure equals the surface tension over the radius. Okay, and look at the balloon. When you start to inflate the balloon, it's very hard. Do you know why it's very hard in the beginning? Because the radius is so small, and that's why the descending pressure is huge. It requires a huge amount of pressure in order to inflate it. But as the balloon gets bigger, the radius goes up and the descending pressure goes down. The pressure needed to descend the balloon is decreasing, that's why it gets easier. Look at this, A and B. Pressure here is 5, pressure here is 10. Huh, so B has a higher pressure and therefore it will have a higher surface tension. As long as the radius is the same, which happens to be true. Look at this example, here is balloon A and balloon B and there's a valve in between. Oh. A is smaller. Smaller, you mean smaller radius. Yes, therefore the descending pressure is huge. So the pressure here is high. It's higher than this one. Therefore, air is going to flow from A to B. So if you open the valve, A will collapse because all the air here was gone. Gone to B. Critical opening and closing pressure. In the beginning, look at this. It's very hard to inflate a balloon. <gasps> As you're trying to increase the volume, you're try the descending pressure is huge. Oh, it's getting really hard until you reach this beautiful sweet spot, and then it gets real easy. Look at this. At this point, the relationship between volume and pressure is inverse, which is the Laplace law. The radius is increasing, and therefore the descending pressure needed to descend the balloon is decreasing, and it gets easier to expand the alveoli. Now, this page is very important. Okay, the smaller the alveolar size, the greater the concentration of the surfactant within this alveolus, and therefore the lower the surface tension. Next, as the alveolus gets larger, bigger and bigger and bigger, the surfactant becomes diluted. And when the surfactant gets diluted, what's going to happen to the surface tension? It's going to increase. What are the causes of pulmonary surfactant deficiency? The most important one is neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. The baby is having intercostal retractions and shorts of breath. It's also known as hyaline membrane disease. How do you treat it? Continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. And you can give a surfactant. If the baby lacks surfactant, give the baby surfactant. Like what? Like drugs that end in actant. So we have bare actant, calfactant, and poor Actant. When we say the word dynamic, it means it happens during movement. It's active. It's during movement. It's not during stagnation. And this depends on Poissier's law and airway resistance equation. Poissier's law. The flow is directly proportional to delta pressure, radius to the fourth power, and it's inversely proportional to 8 times length times viscosity. So let's say that the radius of the alveoli decreased to half. So it was one and then it's half. What's going to happen to the flow? Remember there's a fourth power. So half to the fourth power equals 1 over 16. As the radius decreases into half its original value, the flow will decrease to 1 over 16 of its original value. So if the flow in the beginning was 16, at the end it's going to be only 1. What if the radius decreased from 1 centimeter into 0.84 centimeter? Okay, so you do it like this. 0.84 to the fourth power equals about 0.5. You multiply this by the original V1, which is 16. Half of the 16 is just 8. So you see only this minimal change or minimal reduction in the radius led to a huge reduction in the flow because of the fourth power. This is Poisier's law. Asthma is an obstructive lung disease. I cannot get the air out. The lung will hyperinflate. In physics, there was something called Ohm's law. This is the same thing here. Okay, so R equals delta Q over I. Okay, here in the alveoli, and on top we have the change in pressure and in the bottom we have the flow. So if the resistance increases, what's going to happen to the flow? It will decrease. No kidding. 
We have two types of gas flow, laminar gas flow, beautiful and smooth, turbulent. This is the murmur of your heart. This is the crackles and the wheezing. What is time constant? Time constant is the time needed to inflate the lung to a constant 60% of its capacity. And please remember these equations. Very important. Time constant equals the compliance times the resistance. When you look at this curve and there is volume here and pressure here, what's the slope? It's called compliance. And of course, the higher the curve, the higher the slope. This is higher compliance. So A has higher compliance. That's why it's expanding. And if A has higher compliance, A has a higher time constant, which means we need more time to inflate A. What does the word dynamic mean? During gas flow. Imagine that I have an obstructive lung disease. What happens in obstructive lung disease? It's like Grandpa Sog. It's very lax. Compliance is huge. If compliance goes up, time constant will go up. But in asthma, it's a different story. Asthma is bronchial hyperreactivity and increased secretion. So resistance goes up. Therefore, time constant goes up. However, restrictive lung disease is the opposite. What happens? Oh, my lung is restricted from filling. Compliance is down. Therefore, time constant is decreasing. Look at this ratio, dynamic compliance over lung compliance. What happens in obstructive lung disease like emphysema? Lung compliance increases. When you increase the denominator, what happens to the whole ratio? It decreases. And that's why obstructive lung disease is the lower slope of the curve. But the normal is a straight line. Ventilatory patterns. We have tidal volume, ventilatory rate, and time relation between inspiration and expiration. What is tidal volume? This is the volume during normal quiet breathing. <sighs> and it's usually 500 mLs. What is the respiratory rate between 12 and 18? What's the inspiration to expiration ratio? Look at yourself when you breathe. <sighs> Expiration is normally longer, and that's why one for the inspiration, two, two for the expiration. Normal breathing is called eupnea. What's the normal eye to ear ratio? One to two. What's the normal tidal volume? 500. What's the normal respiratory rate? 12 to 18. Faster than this, tachypnea. Slower than this, bradypnea. Deeper than this, hyperpnea. Deeper and faster, hyperventilation. Three types of dead space, anatomical, normal, alveolar, abnormal, physiological is anatomical plus alveolar. Do you remember your tidal volume? Yeah, the 500 mLs. Out of these 500, 150 will not contribute to gas exchange. And that's why we, what we call the anatomical dead space, totally normal. However, the alveolar dead space are your bad alveoli that are not interacting and not involved in gas exchange. This is a pathology. This is never normal. What's the physiological? Basically, you add the anatomical to the alveolar. For normal people, anatomical for me is 150. I don't have any alveolar because I'm normal, therefore my alveolar is zero. 150 plus zero equals 150 physiological dead space. At the apex of my lung, I have high pressure and therefore a lower compliance. However, at the base of my lung, I have low pressure and therefore high compliance. It's more effective ventilation at the base of my lung because it's a higher compliance. Compliance is the expansibility or distensibility of my lung. At the apex of my lung, the intra-pleural pressure is more negative. Therefore, it sucks in the air more. <gasps> Oh, so, oh, look at this. It's a huge alveoli, but look at this. Not so much. Please do not confuse pulmonary ventilation with alveolar or minute ventilation. What's pulmonary ventilation? You just get the respiratory rate times the tidal volume. Okay, how about the alveolar ventilation, which is what actually matters? This is the respiratory rate times, not the tidal volume. No, no, no. You should remove the bad 150 mLs because they are dead space. If I'm breathing like this shallow and never... <laughs> I sound like an idiot. Decrease alveolar ventilation, which is what actually matters. But deep, slow breathing like a wise person, <sighs> that's an increased alveolar ventilation, which is what actually matters. Both of them can have the same pulmonary ventilation, but we don't care. What matters more is the alveolar minute ventilation, because this first dude was just ventilating his dead space. Well done! So just because your respiratory rate is increased doesn't necessarily mean that your alveolar ventilation is increased. You could be just ventilating your dead space. <laughs> 
and here is a guaranteed exam question. So, you have a patient, and the patient is having breathing problem. Okay, you would like to increase the minute ventilation or the alveolar ventilation. Is it better to increase the respiratory rate, or is it better to increase the tidal volume? The answer is the tidal volume. Increasing the respiratory rate is kind of rough. <laughs> Nonsense. Always increase the tidal volume. Here are three people. A is normal. B, when you increase respiratory rate, bad idea. C, with, with, when you increase the tidal volume, which is a good idea, like a wise person. Look at this beautiful alveolar minute ventilation. Therefore, increasing the tidal volume is a better way to achieve more alveolar ventilation than increasing the respiratory rate. Raising the respiratory rate too much is also bad. Why? In obstructive lung disease, the patient is having problem getting the air out. Oh. If you increase the respiratory rate of ventilator too much, <laughs> okay, the patient could not get the, f the previous air outside of the lungs. So the patient is stacking air on top of air, on top of air, on top of air. We call this air trapping or air stacking or O2 peep. Pros and cons of O2 peep. Pros, it keeps the alveoli open. But cons, it makes the intrapleural pressure more positive. Therefore, it will decrease venous return and therefore decrease cardiac output and therefore decrease my blood pressure it might also lead to tension pneumothorax side effects of too much respiratory rate air stacking or o2 peep beware if the patient has asthma or copd any obstructive lung disease if you increase the tidal volume too much it can lead to inflammation please be very careful in patients with ARDS, which is an inflammation. If you increase the FiO2 too much, bad idea. So instead of 21%, you give 100%. For a long period of time, this can lead to oxygen injury or barotrauma or bronchitis or bronchopulmonary dysplasia in children. PEEP, too much PEEP, lower the venous return, lower the cardiac output, and lower the blood pressure. Beware in patients with hypotension. Imagine a patient with emphysema. <gasps> Tidal volume is high, but respiratory rate is low because it takes me a lot of time to expire. And of course, obstructive lung disease will raise the compliance. However, restrictive lung disease, we have low compliance. There is low tidal volume because that space available for gas exchange has decreased. This is a patient who has removed one lung. Or this is a patient with fibrosis, pneumoconiosis, asbestosis, etc. But the respiratory rate as a compensation will go up. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and good luck to you.